So Mr. James Altschuler, I'm so happy that you are here. Um, well, you're... thank you for having me here and it's Altschuler, but yes, thank Altucher. you for having me. I, I really it appreciate it. Quit the your day job. Of, the thing about you is I've like loved you from afar and love the way you think and write and I like your thank hair. You. Um, thank you. And I, I know that my audience is going to be so into this. So can we talk a little bit about your journey to finding to finding this place where you start blogging and everyone starts to read and listen and go crazy. Like what was the arc that led you even to start sharing your words? Okay. And I'll try to make it, it's a very good question. And I'll try to make it as quick as possible because everyone, everyone should have a different path. Like if you just, you know, go to school, get a graduate degree, get a job, you're writing and, and it turns into something that's like a straight and normal path. And it's nobody ever does that. Right. And I, I, this, this in 1990, I had a crush on this girl and she liked this guy who kept calling himself a writer and he would read James Joyce and he had a little beard and he'd read Thomas Pynchon and he'd always carry around a pen and she was like in love with him and I was in love with her. And so I figured, you know what? People like writers. And I was going to graduate school in computer science at the time. Oh my God. And, I love that. This is how the story begins with a girl. Okay. Yes. And so I just started writing and reading. I had never taken an English class in college. I had never read. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I read a lot, but you know, I kind of stopped reading a lot in, um, in college, but then I just became obsessed. I, I started reading every day for hours and then I would, I dropped out of, or I was kicked out of graduate school because all I would do all day long is I would write 3000 words a day. And I did this for years and years. I wrote four novels, dozens of short stories, nothing got published, nothing. But when you love something, you, you, you keep on going through it and right. you keep on learning. Like people think you should do what you love because it'll make you happy. That's ridiculous. Like I am happy. I love TV. If I really wanted to be happy, I would watch TV all day long. But when you do something you love, anything that's worth doing, you're going to be unhappy a lot of the time. Not most of the time, but a lot of the time, because as you when you love something, you want to get better at it. You want to master it. And as you get better, you, you encounter more and more resistance uh, from from the higher and higher levels have good people. You know, if you're playing tennis and you want to master it the better you get, the harder the competition is. So you're going to lose more games as you learn to get that, that level. And then you'll be unhappy. So getting good at something implies some level of dealing with frustration and so on. And the energy required to deal with that requires that you love something else. A lot of your energy is going to be spent convincing yourself to do something you don't love. Better to put that energy. We have a limited supply of energy every day. Better to put that energy into mastery rather than, oh, do I really have to do this again? So I loved writing and I, I started working at HBO, which gave me a chance to do some writing. And then um, I, I got into a long story. I, I started making websites and I started doing it as a business. I sold that business for a lot of money. And then I went totally broke, 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 broke. I went from $15 million in the bank to $143 at my low point, couldn't pay my mortgage, lost my home, lost my friends because everybody was friends with you on the way up. Nobody's God, friends. What a story. Down. And I was suicidally depressed. Like I would walk around and I would say to myself, how do people do that? How do people have the muscles to make their mouth smile? I don't even understand. Like I didn't even remember if I had ever smiled and I, and it was really hard. And then one time I just, I liked, it's odd, but I like these waiters pads and uh, I bought a box of waiters pads and every morning I would start writing ideas down on them, 10 ideas a day to exercise. I felt like you had to exercise the idea muscle. Like if you don't exercise it, it atrophies. And after a few weeks of this, I felt like I was getting out of the depression. Like my neurons started firing. I started having ideas of books to write, businesses to start, people to help. and one thing turned into another and I started, I started thinking of art ideas for this one writer who I liked to write. I was, I was getting interested in investing and I sent um, this writer, uh, Jim Kramer, 
hey, you should write these 10 articles. And I, one of my idealists was 10 articles I would like to read if Jim Cramer wrote. And he was a, a writer for thestreet.com and CNBC and Yahoo. And he wrote back right away and said, these are great. You should write them. And finally, for the first time ever, because I was sharing my ideas, I was getting paid to write. I framed a, the first $200 check I wrote for writing an article. A few years, I, I, and then I got, because I had spent so much time practicing literary style writing and fiction writing, I was actually a very good financial writer because I wasn't a dry, like buy Apple stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would tell like these insane stories that would lead to some recommendation. And so I got my first book deal. I got started writing for big newspapers, got the second book deal, the third book deal, the fourth, fifth, and they were all boring. They were all, I mean, they were interesting, but about <laughs> finance, but for me now, I don't like writing about finance, but I went broke. I started another business, made money, went broke. I started another thing, made money, went broke. This happened to me four times where, and I kept thinking, I said, why is this happening to me? And it was really difficult psychologically at the worst moments. And, and then finally I kind of got through it a little bit and I, and something changed. I said, you know, nobody cares about what stocks to buy or whatever, like that's so unimportant. And so I started writing, I went broke and this is what happened. And all these insane stories, cause I had gone broke so many times and had so many weird experiences in the process. And so I started writing about that and people thought I was insane or, or that I was about to die. And I was writing my confessions. Like no one ever had ever written this kind of style before, particularly in finance. <clears throat> and now what I call failure porn is like a, a, a mainstream genre, but, uh, Oh I was God, writing I this every day and, and people were like, what the hell is this guy doing? And, and people would call me like, I heard you had a stroke. And, but, but the odd, and people were saying, you're never going to get a business opportunity again. And the odd thing was because I was being so honest and I became known as this honest, very vulnerable person who was telling about all these failures. I got more opportunities than ever. I got a larger audience than ever because so many people were going through this, but afraid to say it. And that led to, me thinking of all sorts of ways people could help themselves in this very difficult world. Like your podcast is titled, you know, quit your day job. And uh, uh, I was writing about uh, all these work related things, all these career related things that I was taught all my life was just BS. Almost everything I was taught was wrong about not only education, but about how one should live one's life and what are good financial decisions versus bad? What are good life decisions? What are good career decisions? You know, what's the normal way to do things or else there's a stigma? Well, it turns out, dive into the areas where there's a stigma. Like for instance, self-publishing and success is often there because no one's there. And so I was writing about this and it was getting more and more popular. And I realized, well, what did I do to bounce back every time? And I started writing about that. So it kind of verged between this narrative nonfiction that was almost like fiction, but nonfiction and self-help. I was like kind of combining the genres and I started writing books related to this. And so I wrote a book called Choose Yourself and I self-published it because I wanted to show people you could be successful self-publishing. My most recent book is traditionally published, but I've gone back and forth depending on my goals for that book. And that turned out to be my most successful book ever with more than a million copies sold. And there's a TV series about mm -hmm. it and, oh, and all, all these things. And, um, and Amazon loved it. I was the best uh, self-published nonfiction book ever. And uh, it, it, you know, it, it's just been a great ride writing. And I'm, I think a lot of writers want to write a book because it's a thing to do, but the art and science of writing is so beautiful to me. And to this day, you know, 30 years after I started writing, I still, it's probably, I've loved many things since then. And, and I've tried to master many skills, but writing is, is my, my, my second true love. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a, a ranked chess master. That's my first true love, but uh, writing is, is up there with chess. Okay. Here's the thing. First of all, I just have to say it because every cell in my body just wants to say this to you. You are so lovable. It's, oh, thank you it's, so much. It's like you're. I don't always believe that, but I'll go along. You're with it. so lovable. You're you're fascinating. You're adorable. You're endearing. You're humble, and you're brilliant. 
And to witness you talking, it's like watching a conductor like conduct this incredible symphony and you're making it all up. You can tell it's like you're saying it for the first time as you're saying it, even though it's not the first time. And it's it's such a pleasure and it's so generous that you show up with this kind of energy all the time. And I just want to like hold witness to that, number one. Number two, no wonder you're so successful because of that, that thing, which is that's you. And everybody knows it, whether they read three lines of your writing or, or saw you on camera for one second. It's like, it's just you. It's this very special sort of unique starburst thing. And then you like said 17 things that I wish we could unpack because they're so juicy. But the one thing I want to unpack because this audience needs it so much is that loop when you said, and I just kept starting and failing things four times, I think you said, and I, I was very frustrated. You didn't use those words, but it was a, it was a difficult situation. And then you started writing about that. Right. And that's where a lot of things started to pop, but that's where a lot of the audience is where, um, they can't seem to get something to catch, right? Like they're looking and trying, what do we need to do? <laughs> Or who do we need to be? Or how do we need to reapproach the way we're thinking or connecting? What, what is it that you learned from what wasn't working that helped you find a way in to what does work? So, so that, that's a great question because on the one hand, the answer I feel embarrassed about because it's almost cliche-like. And, and then it gets more sophisticated in terms of what happens after that. But I remember one time I was going broke. And this was the second time I was losing a house. And I was so Ugh. upset at myself. I remember <sighs> I had bought two houses actually that was on the same property because I had just sold another business. And this was like in 2009 or 2007, something like that. And it was before the financial crisis. So I didn't even need a financial crisis to go broke. It was like, everybody <laughs> was, everybody was like making tons of money and on real estate. And uh. I was about to lose. And, and the IRS had put signs up all over my house. I was about to lose my house. And I remember I was in this hammock in between the two houses. The money I had worked really hard for building another business and selling it and so on was just gone. And, um, and I, and I remember it just started raining. And again, it just, I hate when it's things sound like a cliche, but this is the story. And I remember thinking to myself, why did this happen again? Like, I think I'm a smart person, but this keeps happening. It doesn't happen to other people as much. It doesn't seem like I didn't know that maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And and I didn't really have an answer then, actually. But a, a, a few years later, I kind of thought about it. And I realized on the way up, I was very disciplined about taking care of myself. So I, I, I started what I called my daily practice, which, again, will seem obvious. But, you know, physical, emotional, creative, and spiritual health, those four things improve 1% a day, which doesn't mean anything. How do you improve 1% creatively? There's no way to quantify that. But physical health just means eat, sleep, move. Like eat well, not great. You don't have to be, you know, Superman. Sleep, try to sleep eight hours. That's very important. And move occasionally. Sometimes it's easy for me to just sit in front of the computer all day, but it's good to move and get the body moving and exercise a little bit. And again, you know, I, I hardly ever been to the gym, just keep moving. And uh, emotional, because if you're sick in bed, you can't have ideas, you can't be creative, you're just sick. And emotional health is obvious. If you're arguing with your friends or your family or your spouse or your boss, you're not gonna have energy to be creative. You need energy. A creative health, everybody says, oh, well, when inspiration hits me, I'm there. But inspiration only hits you if the doors are open. So you, know, keep, you, you keep the doors open by exercising this idea muscle. Every day on a waiter's pad, I write down 10 ideas a day without fail. I always write down 10 ideas a day. And, uh, and then uh, spiritual health doesn't mean, you know, pray to God, although it could, everybody's different, but it just means basically don't time travel. So regrets are time traveling to the present, uh, to the past, Anxiety is time traveling to the future. And it take that both of those activities take away energy from now. And energy is what you need flowing through you. And you can't spend it anywhere else. Again, people act like they have infinite energy. 
but they don't. They they get burnt out. They get depressed. And if you waste energy on, like I mentioned earlier, doing what something you don't love, arguing with a spouse, not being healthy, if it takes too much energy to come up with new ideas or if regrets, whatever, you're not going to have the energy needed to be successful against the other 6 billion people who are also trying to be successful. Not that it's a competition, but if they're all successful and you're not, it's not going to feel good. And so that was kind of, that helped me a lot. But then I started, this is more recently, I started thinking of really practical techniques because I found that my interests were changing a lot and I'm kind of only good at things I'm obsessed with. And again, that's sort of true for everyone because if it requires energy to convince yourself to sit down and say, oh my God, I got to do another podcast today. The podcasters who love it will crush you and people will right. listen to them. <laughs> right. Or if it, if it says, oh my gosh, I got to sit down and write. I hate writing, but I really want people to think I'm an author. Uh, you won't be able to compete against the people who just love it. Like I read every book a, about writing. I read the best books that come out. And then I love to sit down and have ideas and be crazy with them and, and write. So, so, um, so, uh, but I switch interests a lot. Like I was interested in writing, of course, and I was interested in the internet and entrepreneurship. And then I was interested in investing and being a professional investor. And then I got interested in, I don't know, podcasting, uh, even I got obsessed for many years with stand-up comedy. So five nights a week for the past six or seven years, I go on stage and perform. And then during the day, I do my usual stuff, but I got obsessed with it. And that's a really painful thing to be obsessed with because it's a very difficult skill. Oh and God. and then and so then I started thinking, well, I don't whenever I change an interest and I, and I know I'll change them again. I'm already kind of going through that process. I'm too old now to do the 10,000 hour rule. You know, so you know that rule that Malcolm Gladwell popularized where it says, Yes, and I know this is in your book, in your new book. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. And, and so it's the, it's the idea that 10,000 hours are needed of deliberate practice to make you a master of something. Well, I, I kept thinking, well, that's a long time. I, I'm, I can't spend another 10 years trying to get good at right, something. Right. And I realized this is total and utter BS in every possible way. And, and I know this very deeply because A, I've had a lot of people on my podcast related to the 10,000 hour rule, including Professor Anders Ericsson, who developed the rule in the early sure. 90s. Also, I was part of the experiments in the early 90s where he discovered the 10,000 hour rule. He studied violinists, memory experts, and chess players. And I was a master level chess player as a kid. Incredible. So, so I started to think, well, what, what? And then I was going back and forth with him well, what's 10,000 hours mean for comedy? And can you skip the 10,000 hours? And we, he couldn't figure out what's a metric to, to measure progress. There's no answer. So I, I started thinking, well, what is the answer here? And I started unpacking not only for myself, what did I do every time I switched interests and, and then achieved monetary success at it, um, which is very important for, for skill development is that there's skill development, but there's also understanding the field and the industry enough so that you could monetize it. And a lot of books that are about meta learning completely ignore the fact that in order to make any use of this, you have to make money at it. And so, and, and not that the goal is money, but money is one way to measure progress and, and money allows you to do something sure. with, because you're making money from it. And uh, uh, so that's what this book skip the line is about is basically kind of 23 techniques I use and I've used and my 800 podcast guests have used to master things. Like everyone always says, when you start something new, James, you can't, you can't possibly think you could do this. You can't be a hedge fund manager. You need to get an MBA, work at Goldman Sachs, maybe start off as an assistant at a big hedge fund, then move to another one, then get clients. And I'm thinking that's going to take 15 years. And a year after someone told me that I was running a hedge fund with stand-up comedy, Somebody said, James, James, James. This is a professional comedian. Says, I've been doing this. Some guy said to me, I've been doing this 25 years. You got to do this, this, this. You can't skip the line. You got to pay your dues. And he was saying this to me 30 seconds before I was going up on stage to do my first 60 minute show. And I'm thinking to myself, why are you trying to trash my show here? And 
and with everything, with writing, podcasting, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, playing games, playing a sport, I figured there were solid techniques for skipping the 10,000 hour rule. So one of them I call the 10,000 experiment rule, like much more valuable to do experiments than to do repetitive practice of your forehand so you get better at tennis. And I give a lot of examples in the book. I have examples from my own life. And then there's a whole bunch of techniques like this. I have another technique about the best ways to um, structure how you learn. Uh, I, I have another chapter about micro skills. I have another chapter. I have a bunch of chapters about how do you get also get good at your field, particularly persuasion techniques and another chapter called uh, Two Steps Back. I'm happy to talk about any of these. Oh, my techniques. God, James. Everything you say is the best. I'm really oh, thank you. I know I knew I would love you because I love Seth Godin. And I like Larry David. So put it together and it's you. And I'm happy. I, I'm very happy. I, I love I love them as well. They're really, <laughs> they're both really good people. And um, I've I never met Larry down, David. I haven't either. I walked down the, in my wedding dress, walked down the aisle to the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme song. That's how much I love him. And you're just all of those things. And I didn't know that you've been doing stand-up comedy, but I'm obsessed with everything that comes out of your mouth. But so, by the way, like Curb Your Enthusiasm, people don't realize what a great leader Larry David is like. and he, Oh my God, what a sentence. I've never yeah. heard him use in the word with the word leadership, but thank you for that. Let, let's take it as, as an example, Seinfeld. So Larry David's the first person to, you know, he was the showrunner along with Jerry, but Jerry, Larry was the main guy because Jerry was also starring in it. And so he didn't have time to also right. manage the whole production, right. which is a billion dollar production. And, uh, but Larry David realized early on that, he didn't want any actors sitting around on the side because some, you know, if you watch Friends, some of the episodes are about, you know, Joey or some are about Monica and the other actors are kind of on the sidelines a little bit. And that's the case for almost every sitcom. So, so Larry David realized every character needs a storyline so that they're always busy and they're never disappointed. And that was kind of brilliant. And then for Curb Your Enthusiasm, of course, the brilliant idea is, I'm not going to write a script. I'm going to write three pages of notes and I'm going to hire and all the actors, quote unquote, are stand up comedians. Yeah. They're going to know they're going to read the notes and we're going to and they're going to improv and we're going to keep shooting every scene until everyone's laughing. And that's why the laughter feels really natural on Curb it's, Your Enthusiasm. It's the best. It's all I mean, the best. And you, yeah. you, I knew that I knew this would be so much fun. So, OK, so. This book, I'm already like drooling over it. Um, I love it so much. Let me ask you, you this. OK, so. There's 23 things in it and we can kind of, I want you to take this where, where, where you want it to go. But my thought is this, um, we are not logical. We're biological. We're, we're filled with oxytocin, oh, dopamine, I love that quote. cortisol, we're all this stuff. Right. And so the more I meditate and the more I kind of like show up, I realize how many people ask me all the time, what do you need to do? What are the steps? What do you need to do? And I find a lot of it is like the wrong question is what do you need to do? It's more like, who do you need to be? It's more like this. There's like a vibration. There's like a resonance. There's like a something. And when you walk into that something, that's, that's the move. And that's where you and I spoke before we started recording about Brian Grazer. Like that's that, whatever that is, right? He's a lightning rod of enthusiasm, walks in a room, meets Ron Howard and just like, let's just do something. And then like something happens, even though he was like a nobody, he became a some, right? So, and I think that that's you and that's Seth and that's Larry. Those are all the people we we're talking about right now. It's, it's a vibration. That's to me what skips the line. Yeah. Um, how do you, do you agree with that? If you do, how do we explain that? And if you don't agree with that, then what I guess is the answer to what do we do? If it's well, not, who do we be? I 100% agree. And uh, I have something which I believe is in this book, uh, skip the line. I have something called the Google technique, which describes this. So let's say I go to Google and I say, Google, I really want to buy a motorcycle. Tell me everything you know about motorcycles. Google immediately says back, listen, James, we don't know anything about motorcycles, <laughs> but we've done the homework for you. Here are the top 10 websites we think are the best websites about motorcycles. By the way, three of them paid us to tell you this, but the rest of them you should go to. And, and, and then the next time I want, let's say I, I, I want to go back and I want to research STDs. 
I go, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to Google. And Google's going to say, James, once again, we don't know anything about STDs. We're sorry. We hope you don't have one. But here are the top 10 sites we think you should go to. And Google measures its success by quickly how people leave it. And so you think, boy, that's stupid. Most places want you to stay and enjoy the, enjoy the store, whatever. Uh, but Google measures their own success by how many nanoseconds it takes for you to leave uh, the Google website. And so, so Google has a trillion and a half dollar valuation. So what does this mean? Why am I bringing up Google? Well, what if you did this as a person that every time someone comes to you, you immediately share all your best ideas and say, hey, eh, hey, knock yourself out. I don't need credit. I don't need money. Just do do you could do it or not. But here's my suggestions for you uh, uh, based on my experience. You're going to have the, some effect like Google has. Google's a trillion and a half dollars. You're not going to be worth that because you're not Google, but you, it will create the process of doing that will almost naturally create money. And I can even give you many examples in my own life where this has happened. So I'll, I'll give you one quick example. Um, there's this radio host, uh, Charlemagne the God from The Breakfast Club. And he has, a, he, he has like 10 million listeners a day. And I heard him do an interview once, uh, just a few months ago, uh, it was last May. And I'm like, wow, there's something in there resonated with me. And so on my idea list for that morning, I wrote down 10 chapters if Charlemagne were to write a book about this one line he just said. And I sent him the ideas and I said, you know, I just think this is good for you, um, but ignore this. I just do this regularly. Ignore this if you want, no need to respond and good luck. And he writes back right away and he says, this is great. We should do this as a book together. And I'm like, no, 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 this is for you. It doesn't work for me as a, as a book. It, it's it's for you to do. and. And, and then he said, okay, but can you tell, uh, can you flesh this out a little more? I'm really happy. And I fleshed it out more. And he says, James, we have to do this together. And I'm like, no, 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 we can't do it. Well, anyway, a lot of things happened and it ended up being, it's going to be an audio book with Amazon. Amazon loves it so much. It's this book about racism by Charlemagne with James Altucher. And it's, they're going to put it on the, you know, they're going to do so much marketing for it. it. It's coming out March 31st. I don't mean to advertise this while we're talking about skip the line. Why? Why? So, this is so good. Go, this, go, this, keep going. This, this is an example though. Everyone says, oh no, someone's going to steal my ideas. If he does this, I want some money. No, no, no. Money is a symptom of, of giving and sharing and being known as the person of abundance. You have to have this a mindset where it's great if someone steals my ideas. I am so abundant with ideas that I have overflow. I can't do every good idea and I have too many of them. And so an abundance mindset gets you abundance. A scarcity mindset where, oh no, they're gonna steal my ideas. This is my one shot at, at immortality. A, a scarcity mindset, you don't know if something's gonna succeed or not in, in advance. Nobody knows anything. And so a scarcity mindset will actually prevent you from having abundance because it, you won't give yourself the opportunities for abundance. And then let's say someone does steal my ideas. No problem. People have stolen billion dollar ideas from me. No problem because A, it verifies that I'm the guy with good ideas. B, more often than not, they come back to me with asking for more ideas and then they, they realize what they did before. They might offer opportunity or money or whatever. Or I just, because I'm so validated that they made $100 million with my idea, I'll come up with other ideas and send them to different people. And then eventually opportunity happens. Oh, so, so the good. Google technique works. It's so good. There's so much energy that you're giving in everything that you just said. It's, it's like photosynthesis. So, so here's the thing. And I want to know how you connect this back to being a chess player as a kid. I'm just curious. Because my audience will say to me all the time, that sounds great. That makes sense. Except I have this problem, which is a story I tell myself about how I have imposter syndrome. None of my ideas are worth sharing. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to do is put something out there if it would be mediocre or messy. So I'm just going to sit over here and think a lot before I do anything or say anything or send anything or press publish on yeah. anything. 
so what I'm a great question what because you think about that. that is that is the mindset of most people and look that was the mindset of me most of my life but that's a great question because first off the writing of ideas the only purpose of that is to exercise this idea muscle because it will atrophy very quickly and then you won't have ideas but um the key is is you have to do things and Oh, and by the way, doing things doesn't mean, oh boy, I have an idea. I need to raise, I need to spend six months raising $2 million. And then I need to hire a programmer and spend nine months programming something. And then we'll see if I just wasted two years of my life or not. Like that's not doing something that's being stupid, but doing something is, oh, it took me 15 minutes to write this list of ideas. It takes me 13 seconds to send an email to Charlemagne. And now it's a seed planted into the world. Now I move on to the next thing. You have to do things. So you have to you have to do experiments. You have to try things that have that are easy to do, cheap to do, have very little downside, and have enormous upside. Think about what I sending that email to Charlemagne. And by the way, this is one idea list over across thousands and thousands and thousands amazing. of idea lists. That's amazing. And I've done this consider. many times. And so uh, I I it, it was easy to do. It, it cost me zero money. People think, oh well, it's nice to do if you have a lot of money cost me zero money. There was little downside. The worst that could happen is he doesn't respond. And then I learn what he doesn't, you know, that, that this right. is not the right person to send ideas to. And the upside is what happened, um, which is that, oh, I'm co-authoring what hopefully will be this amazing thing. And uh, uh, most of ideas, most experiments don't work. Most experiments fail, but you even the downside when they fail is you learn something and you have a story to tell. So I'll, I'll tell you an experiment I did. I wanted to experiment with writing because I'm always trying to get to be a better writer. The more, the, the better you are at something you is the more you realize you need to know because you're, you exponentially increase the number of nuances you realize a field has, and then you need to know all about them. So I figured what's an, a good format to tell a story that's not the same blah blog format. And so I figured, um, so then something happened. Uh, Donald Trump, who apparently used to be president of the United States, Donald Trump <laughs> um, made this tweet, I want to buy Greenland. And right away, the prime minister of Denmark tweeted back, it's not for sale. And I was like, that is the weirdest set of tweets I ever saw. Yes, like, it is. The, the, the president of the United States just <laughs> tweeted, I didn't even know you could buy a country. And, and then what the heck, what does Denmark have to do with Greenland? And why is he saying it's not for sale? Did they just do an entire negotiation for a country on Twitter? And so I did some research. Greenland is not a country. It's uh, it's kind of a owned by Denmark, sort of. It's like half owned by Denmark. And there's a lot of reasons that are really important, actually, why somebody, why any country would want to own Greenland. And I won't, we can do a whole podcast now about Greenland. I had to just study this. But so I figured, well, should I write about this? And I said, yeah, let's, yes, but let's do it in a crazy format that could maybe generate some publicity and I'm experimenting with playing around with publicity too. So I wrote down all the reasons why you should buy Greenland. And I tell a little story about it, the story I just told you, but then combined with all the reasons. And I start a Kickstarter. I said, uh, I wanna raise a hundred million dollars myself to buy Greenland. And I gave awards, like if you donate this, oh you could be God. a Duke. If you donate this, you could get a holiday <laughs> named after you. If you donate this, you'll get 10,000 acres of land. And, and I wrote my whole article, what would have been just an article, I wrote it as a, in the Kickstarter format. You know, you could write in any format you want. And this was a, a, an, an experimental format for me. It was also, I had never done a Kickstarter before. So it was an experiment for me to learn how to do Kickstarter. It was an experiment for me about publicity because I did this odd thing, would it generate publicity? So it was like three experiments. And I, I also learned about Greenland. So it was like four experiments in one. And Kickstarter, shut it i started raising money i'd raise like instantly like one or two thousand dollars people started linking to it and saying this is kind of crazy and uh so there was and then kickstarter shut it down because they did not want they knew i was doing a, a joke really that i wasn't going to raise a hundred million dollars and they didn't want to be responsible for the return the credit card fees when they returned the money and so they shut it down so the experiment quote unquote failed and yet i learned about here's the downside i learned about greenland I learned about Kickstarter. I learned more about writing. I learned a little bit more about publicity. So awesome. And 
I had a story that I could tell, like I just told you. And that's the downside of an experiment failing. And by the way, the whole thing took about six hours from beginning to end. It's so, so good. And it I costs love no money. To it. I, it's, it's, it's the best. I love the way your mind works. And that's why I want to ask you this question, which I asked, but I, I asked you too many things at one time. But I'm curious how you're being a chess master as a kid. What did you learn about thinking? What did you learn about strategy from that, that, that you think carries over or do you, or do you think it's not really? Yeah, it, up? it's, it's a really, I always say this is a really good question, but it really is because as a kid, I, I learned. So let me, let me just tell you one thing, which is that about three months ago, <laughs> for the first time in 20 years, I got really burnt out. Everybody gets burnt out something, but I thought I was like immune to it because of this daily practice and uh, I wasn't depressed at all, but I had written something last August, which was my most viral article ever. And most people liked it. But when in, in order for an article to go viral, a lot of people will love it and share it with their friends and so on. But a significant number, like let's say even 5% hate it. So 30 million people had read this article actually, which was incredible for me, like particularly in today's in, attention it's beyond. economy it's, it's yeah major yeah and and let's say five percent hated it which i think was about the right number that means a million and a half people hated it yeah. and the people who liked it went on with their lives the people who hated it harassed me incredibly for four or five months and by november i remember i just i actually was crying because family members had written articles trashing me friends i had lost friends and and Ex-girlfriends had written articles trashing me. Some of my friends lost friends because they tried defending me. And again, oh most God. people love the article, but some people hated it. And, and then other things happened related to it. And it's almost like my brain punished my, or no, it's almost like my brain was trying to protect me. I would sit down to write or, or do anything. And my brain would say, no, 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 no. Remember what happened last time, you'll get punished. And so I literally got burnt out. and. I recognized after a while, okay, I'm not depressed, but I am burnt out. I physically cannot do anything. I stopped Twitter, Facebook, even email, the phone. I was just protecting myself or my brain was forcing me to protect myself. So I had to, I channeled the energy differently. So I decided, okay, I've got this new book, Skip the Line. Let's use my Skip the Line techniques to get, to prove to myself again that it works. And so I haven't studied chess since 1997. So at the time it was 23 years since the last time I had taken a chess lesson or opened a chess book or tried to get better. And even though I was a strong master in 1997, I was a very strong player. Um, you know, when you don't do something for 23 years, my skills were, were about the level of an amateur player. And this is a significant loss. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to spend the next few, as long as I'm burnt out, I'm going to use only the skip line techniques. And even though I had spent years trying to be a chess master, I'm going to get better than I ever was before using the skip line techniques in as quickly, in as quick a time as possible. So I just looked at every chapter of skip the line and I implemented those techniques. I put them in place to make sure I could, I could not only master chess, but be better than I ever was before. And I, I got there. It took about three months, three and a half months, but I'm like the highest ranking or I've been the highest ranking I've, I've ever been before in, oh in my, my life. And my understanding of chess is so much more nuanced because I put these techniques in place. And I would say in when I was a kid and studying, I learned discipline, the discipline of how to study. And, that, and I learned a little bit about calculating and thinking spatially. But now this time, because I took a much more holistic approach, the same approach I would take if I was learning to be a chef or an investor or an entrepreneur or a gardener, anything. It's because the, the techniques in the book are, are, are general. But because I learned these, because I did them methodically, I did every t chapter in the book, I, I really got a much more holistic view of chess. And I realized, oh, this is all about risk management. And this is all about building a network of people who can help you. And this is all about beginner's mind. And this is all about uh, sharing ideas. And, and you learn 
from all these things. Like, and, and this is, I was doing tons of experiments on the chessboard and then studying them later. And like, I have one chapter in the book. So I have one chapter in the book about experiments and the value of experiments. I have another chapter in the book about micro skills. So there's no such skill as business, for instance. Business is a package of micro skills. It's sales, ideas, execution, negotiating, marketing, leadership, management, vision, having visions. And you have to get good at those micro skills. And I realized chess is the same thing. There's openings, middle games, end games, positional play, tactical play, romantic play, classical play, uh, safe play, uh, you know, and then even those have micro skills. Like how do you, what do you do with extra space? What do you do with an open file? I kind of knew these things before, but now I know them at such a deeper level because I broke everything down like this. And then I did um, what I call plus minus equal. Plus is you get a coach, someone who's much better than you. Equals is you find your peers who are all trying to learn together and you exchange ideas with them and you play them and you challenge yourself with your peers and that's your equals. And then minus is you give lessons because if you can't explain something simply, then you don't really understand it. And I find when I give lessons, I learn so much about these, really deeply about these basic concepts because I prepare the lesson and I study. This is what it means to have this type of position. And here's 15 examples. And then I learn what it means and on and on and on. There's again, there's 23 chapters in the book and I used all of them. And very quickly, I did all, put all this in place. And I now have so much more pleasure from the game than I ever had before. And I realized again, oh, this is exactly how I invest. If you, if you stay in the game, you win the game. If you if you just manage, the rewards are always there if you play okay, but if you manage the risks, you will you won't lose from a blunder. Most people lose, they can play a great game, they lose from blundering. Same thing with investing. If, you, if, you, if your money management skills are wrong and you take too much risk, you can make all the great investments in the world, you still will go broke. So if I make all the great moves in the world, I'll still lose the game if I'm not managing risk. If I, if I am able to, date all the most wonderful women in the world, um, I'll still lose everything if I marry the wrong person. So, so you have to manage risk in everything in life. And I didn't realize how important this was for chess actually, and how the, the difference between calculation and blundering, which is a subtle difference. And I, I know I'm going on a lot about this, but I've just spent three and a half months neck deep in burnout. Also, I trying to master chess. Now, why did I choose chess? Well, A, I mentioned it was my first love as a kid. I was a strong master then. I was New Jersey's junior chess champion, but I hadn't played in 23 years. I sucked before. Uh, and uh, the Queen's Gambit had just come out in like November. Right. 62 million people watched it the first week. And everybody started asking me, hey, can you show me how to play chess? Like even my kids were interested. And I'm like, oh, uh, this, is, this is interesting. It's got popular. The, the chess streamers I know have more followers than the best comedians I know. So I figured, okay, it's not such a bad, it's not unproductive, even though I'm burnt out, it's not unproductive to get better at such a, what seems to be getting more valuable now. So that, so understanding the field uh, had importance, understanding who the best players were, I could get lessons from doing experiments. I threw out my entire style of play that I've been playing since I was 18. I used to play the Queen's Gambit actually as my opening. I did the exact opposite and played the most crazy, insane stuff as an experiment, but that gave me this holistic view that I never had before. It's a different game. Anyway, I'm going on and on, but. It's so good. I, and listening to you, I was just thinking it's, a, it's like eating like the most yummy corned beef with the Russian dressing and the rye bread. I'm just like. Katz's Deli in New York. I'm in, I'm all in all the time, the whole thing. And that's why people listen to your podcast and they read what you write. I want to ask you two things. Um, one of the things I just wanted to follow up on what you just said, because so much is in there, but one of the things you were just saying is so important, which is you have to know the difference between a blunder and a risk. And, and I don't know that anybody really understands that very well. And, and everybody's so afraid of taking a risk. So then they usually don't, but 
how do we find the 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 middle ground or the balance in that when you said it could be <laughs> horrible and yet there's there's an importance in staying in it and, and making decisions yeah and the thing is you can't be upset if you make mistakes because mistakes happen and mis- this is what i never really realized before and i only realized this as i was studying this chess i used to think that decision making combines everything it, it's you know the ability to make good decisions it, it's a, it's a spectrum so you make bad decisions at one end of the spectrum you make good decisions at the other end but actually really bad decisions are not part of the spect- spectrum of decision making good decisions are you know you get better and better at like okay this investment idea works this type of entrepreneurship works hiring this person might be good making this chess move might be good that's decision making and at first you might say this move might be good but actually as you get better you realize oh that move i would have played is not so good but mistakes or bl- mistakes in life or business or or they're, they're called blunders in chess where you just you're making moves and you just get checkmated in one move because you didn't see it they're more like blind spots that even if you're great at decision making you're always going to have blind spots if you're a great driver just depends on the car you're going to have blind spots I, I was watching a video last week of the world chess champion, this guy, Magnus Carlsen. He missed a checkmate in one. And this is the guy who makes the best calculation decisions on the planet by far. And he missed a mate in one that he should never miss if it was all related to his ability, ability to calculate. So how do you so how do you solve that is you recognize that it's not about you can't get rid of the mistakes. It's a part of your blind spot but you just have to recognize that the blind spots there and you have to consistently as much as you can be more and more consistent about saying, am I missing anything here? You have to assume I'm an, I'm an idiot without any skills. I'm just an idiot. So there's still a little part of me, no matter what, that's always going to be an idiot. And I have to remind myself of that. Okay. I've got a good move. Look, take another look. Am I about to get checkmated in one move? Am I about to get, I calculated three moves out on the third move. Is there some crazy thing he can do that screws me up? So you just have to say, am am I managing my risk? Are my pieces too far? uh, Are they disconnected? Did I send out a bunch of troops too far away from the rest of the army so they could be disconnected? Um, If so, maybe I should manage the risk a little better and build up a little bit more. And so the great chess players, they just keep building up and building up rather than taking, rather than throwing a piece out there, fishing to be a spy, and then they'll never be able to get him back. Or an investor. I used to say, oh my God, this is a great investing opportunity. I, if I really want to make a lot of money, I should put 20% of my cash in this investment. Well, that's actually, you would think that's an abundance complex, like, oh, I'm trying to make a lot of money, but that's actually a scarcity complex because it assumes this is my one chance to make a lot of money. Um, So I better put 20% of my net worth in this investment. That's a scarcity way of thinking. So the way to manage the, the way to manage risk is to put less uh, of, uh, is to put less of your money into an investment, to not try to checkmate them right away, but keep building up to not um, marry the most what seems like the most beautiful woman in the world because the most amazing person because what if i never what if nobody ever likes me again that's a scarcity way of thinking and so uh uh you know so so with with money for instance i went from investing 20 percent of my net worth in an investment even the best investments possible to no more than one percent of my net worth and consequently i've compounded but uh, the money I make from investing is is my main source of income. And I just keep compounding because I only invest 1%, which gives me more possibilities to invest. I'm abundant and it gives me more cash in the bank so I could sleep at night. And if I lose the entire investment, oh, it's just 1% of my net worth. And if it works out, like amazingly, then it doubles my net worth. Or at the very least, I get my money back and I recycle and put it into something new. So it's all Oh, that is so connected. good. It's so good and it's so so helpful. Okay, the very last question. Oh, oh, and I just want to add to that one more thing is that when you're in a good activity and we all know some people make money from investing, so that's if you do it right, it's a good activity. 
in chess, the reward is winning. And obviously one person wins and one person loses. In writing, um, people have done very successfully writing. So the rewards are always there. I know there are rewards in all these activities, but so 5% of your job is just understanding what the rewards are. Then 95% of your job when you're getting good at something is what are all the risks? There are many more risks than rewards. There's one way to win a chess game. You checkmate the other guy, but there's a billion ways to lose it. There's one way to win in investing is that the company grows and then it sells itself or whatever, but there's a billion ways to lose it. And so again, that's the five percent. It's the ninety-five-five rule, which I just realized, which is that any activity worth doing is five percent reward, ninety-five percent risk mitigation. Well, let me ask you this because last couple things here. One is that everyone is so afraid of the risk of somebody in the world not liking what they're doing, their uncle, their spouse. You know, you oh, yeah. said that you had all this. When something is popular, you're going to have a chunk of people that means that don't like it. Right. And that's a big risk. And I, and when I really sit down and, and listen to people, what I hear is the biggest risk is that they want to please everybody, right? They want to make something that's vanilla ice cream that everybody likes. And, and they can't really handle the idea, the rejection, the discomfort that there will be people who don't like it. And you are literally to me, you're such a lightning rod for you're going to do you. You're just going to do you, right? Well, so how do you help people sit with that? Because most people don't have that kind of courage. Yeah, you're 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 so right. And I and actually you asked that before and and I was gonna answer that as well, but I got into the I went down one rabbit hole. Um it it it's so true. Like people are afraid, for instance, to go up on stage and and speak to a public audience because they might be boring or they might fail and everybody might judge them. People are afraid to go out onto the dance floor. People are afraid to publish something because everyone might, and people are afraid to be vulnerable because of what people will think of them. Right, right. So, so, so one answer is I, I never, this is a conscious thing I do. It's not like an intuitive thing. I never hit publish on an article unless I'm afraid of what people will think of me. A hundred percent of the time. What? Yeah, because if I'm not afraid, that probably means someone has written this before or someone has thought this before or it's no big deal. So I never publish a single thing unless it doesn't have to be the same thing I'm afraid of. It could be different things I'm afraid of, but I have to be afraid of what people will think of me. And for one, for some reason, I have to be able to verbally say what it is I'm afraid of. And, but again, how do you, how do you get to that point? One thing is, is consciously doing it. So even when I go up on stage doing stand-up comedy, I make sure at least 20% of my set is new because I have to be afraid of what people are going to think. And that's, oh my God. if people don't like you in comedy, they hate you. They, they boo you. So one experiment I did once was I wanted to learn, this is in the first year I was doing it. I wanted to learn how to deal with a hostile audience. So I went on a subway car and I did comedy on a subway car. And then on every stop, I switched cars and would do it again. Hostile audience, Oh, very quick to, I have to convince people to laugh in a very quick amount of time. And I did this for about two hours, jumping from car to car. And it was an experiment. And I learned a lot about doing comedy with a hostile audience. And now I could, not that I'm perfect at handling it, but I can handle it. The other thing is, and this is really the important factor, is that let's say you write, let's say you're afraid of writing something because what will people think of you? Again, an abundance complex, you're going to write more than one thing in life if you love writing. So just keeping that in mind. Uh, if, you, if someone loves something you write, a lot of people will read it. If somebody, if you write something awful, which you will, if you write something awful, not that many people are going to read it because it was awful. So actually, on, your, on the stuff that you do that sucks, no one really will remember it. People will only remember your good stuff. If Larry David has done some shitty things, but we don't. We only remember Curb Your Enthusiasm in Seinfeld. He's written a, mo a movie, which I've watched twice, and I can't even remember the title of the movie. It sucks so bad. Uh, like, I just don't remember it. And so that's really the answer, is that uh, assuming this is not the only time you do something, it, it, I've, okay, I'll tell you one story, quick story. I've been doing comedy for six years. Again, and nobody thought I could skip the line take 20 years, blah, blah, blah. I've, but since then I've toured all over the world. I've toured all over the country. 
clubs constantly ask me to come back. I bring in a nice audience. People don't even know the other side of my life. They just, they know me from the comedy side. And, uh, but, and I haven't been heckled since year one, but a few months ago, and this is around the time also of my burnout starting, I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, which a friend of mine told me later is the crack capital of the world. Oh and, and a friend of mine told me later, whatever you do, don't joke about crack or Democrats. And I didn't know these things. And I told this one joke, I won't repeat the joke, but it was basically about um, someone asking me uh, if, can you believe, you know, Hunter Biden was smoking crack with whores in China? And I'm like, of course I could believe that he's the son of a president. If my kid's school bus driver was smoking crack with whores in China, I would not believe that. And that was the, uh, that wasn't the joke, but that's the essence of the joke. Yeah. And then I would ask people like, I thought crack was this eighties drug. Like when was the last time you smoked crack or you smoke crack? Like, can't you afford cocaine now? And um, well, apparently <laughs> everybody in the audience loved crack and Hunter Biden. And they started, I had never experienced this actually, even my year one, they started screaming at me. Like they started yelling, like, you know, get off the stage, you freak, you Jew, get off the stage, oh get, get the hell out of here. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like the other four shows I've done here were great. What is wrong with, you know, what is happening here? Just explain to me, just teach me. And they're like, just get off the stage. And then even the next day, two people from that audience emailed me to say, you really aren't funny. You should think of another thing to do. And, and, you know, and, but here's the, here's the point yesterday, the exact same club and the manager was in the audience. And so I was like, oh, well, they're never asking me back. The manager was in the audience. They asked me to come back for six more shows. And I'm like, no, I don't really feel like it, but still like nobody remembers oh your bad moments. God. Oh my God. That's so fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, you are amazing. Tell us where we can listen to your podcast, read what you're writing, all the books, the next book, skip the line. It's coming out February. Oh my God. It's already it's out. Out. It came yesterday. It came out yesterday. And uh, cool. yeah. So, so skip the line uh, is, is out. I hope people buy it and, and like it and share it with their friends and it, you know, either review it or tweet to me if, if you like it. And uh, I'm going to make probably a newsletter with like skip the line sort of ideas and techniques and opportunities. Like I always think of cheap and easy businesses people could start or, or easy ways to write a, a I have, I have like a, a 30 day book challenges where I give a structure and uh, you can write a book like this in 30 days and then hundreds of people have written books. And so I'm going to write about that. That's sort of a skip the line in writing a book. And so uh, if you just Google me, you see me everywhere, but, but definitely skip the line is, is I'm super proud of it. I'm proud of doing this podcast. I, I kind of want to air this podcast on my podcast. Cause I think this is a great interview and thank you so much, Kathy, for, for James, having me on. I want to be friends with you. You're uh, a delight. I had so much fun with you. We will send out the link to your book everywhere. And, um, thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, good luck. And I'm amazed how you get such great guests. Like uh, uh, I had you here. This is one of my favorite conversations ever that I've oh, ever had. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. And good luck. And yeah, let's get in touch in Florida. I'll see you soon. I love that. That makes me so happy. You're the best. Happy Purim. Okay. Bye. Bye.